is uh, Roman. I'm from the GPAC project, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, MPEG Dash and low latency. Uh, first, a few words um, about the GPAC project. We are the MP4 guys. I think that's how people know us. Um, GPAC has started 20 years ago. It's been like almost 15 years ago. Uh, we provide several tools. I think the tool that people usually use is our MP4 box packager. We have other tools in the cloud base. Um, we have uh, three community of users. It's just a few words. It's, that's the only kind of GPAC. Um, we have researchers, we have video enthusiasts, and uh, we also have the industry. And uh, we are pretty active also in uh, standardization at uh, MPEG, uh, W3C, and we have contribution on the wide scope of projects. There are links here if you're interested uh, to know more about our work. Um, so today we're trying to say a few words about um, the MPEG Dash low latency stuff. You may know about how adaptive streaming works. Uh, it's not really suitable for low latency, but if you think more deeply about it, there is no real reason why we can't achieve um, some low latency using this technology, and this is what this uh, presentation is about. Um, this presentation, uh, since it's uh, supposed to be a lightning talk, uh, won't be about you know, really technical specifics to MPEG Dash. Um, usually, when we talk about MPEG Dash and active streaming, what happens is that you have an encoder that produces chunks of segments, so that's basically 2 to 10 seconds of data that's being encoded, packaged, uh, copied on the server, and then you have a player getting the data back and usually the players um, buffer three segments. So if you make the addition of the segments you, of this latency, you have 8 to 40 seconds latency. And uh, probably you heard that the industry was not happy about, you know, at every four years at a world, at the soccer world cup, they say this is uh, too much. Um, so the, the view from the industry is basically to consider that um, you know, there are people doing real-time stuff, like, you know, Skype-like applications with RTC, and they consider that it's not scalable, so we're not going to discuss about this, and uh, basically they consider that things are low latency if you're faster than the traditional broadcast TV uh, systems. So, of course, if you consider 8 to 40 second latency, that's pretty long. Uh, their goal is to go... Um, under the, the five second latency, which is their usual latency, we're going to discuss where the latency is in, in these workflows. And uh, basically, on the GPAC team, we show that we could go as low as 40 milliseconds latency using a big dash. Um, so, the, basically, all that the industry says is probably due to the fact that they, have, they make the wrong assumption on the way they use this technology. Um, the first thing they say is that when you use MPEG Dash and this adaptive streaming stuff, you need to use the, the playlist and then you have these uh, segments that you need to download. The truth is that when you're low latency, you need information to be able to connect to the stream and then you get the stream at the pace it comes to you and you keep on reading the same way you got these broadcast signals or some radio. Uh, the second thing is that uh, most people say that the segments uh, is the latency, unit, but the truth is that you can start sending information while the segment is not complete. So basically if you use a PTS, that's a transport stream uh, uh, format, so you uh, basically don't need to have more than one frame of latency, and it's the same in Adobe MFM before. Basically you have the segments, you have the fragments, and you can put one frame or a set of frames basically a uh, gap uh, inside the fragments. Um, the third approximation is that um, if the file, the segment is not complete on the server, you cannot start to serve it. And that's not true again. We have fetch API in the browsers, and if you use HTTP chunked, um, chunk transfer, you can start the lo loading things while uh, they are not entirely uploaded on the server, which means that you have a direct transfer from the packager of the encoder directly to the player. Um, I think it's important also to say that uh, 
in the industry, uh, because of the transmission cost, we use a lot of caching, you know, the CDS, so we have these segments, we put them on caching servers, and basically if the content is popular, it's being, it's being replicated on servers that are uh, near your home. Um, and most of the people think that the content is being pushed using, I don't know, AI or statistics, but uh, that's not exactly the truth. Um, if we, you consider low latency from what we saw from CD, and they pull the content. And if you have a player requesting for a content, and they decide to uh, replicate and mirror the content on different servers, uh, depending on who's putting the content. Uh, so when it comes to low latency, basically the first player that's going to request the content is going to connect directly to the origin. So that's something that we're going to talk about. And the, the fourth approximation is this thing that I showed that the player needs to buffer three segments. That's the main source of latency. This is a legacy thing from Apple when they launched HLS. But it's actually, you, you, don't, know, you don't need that. Um, practically, it causes problems to most players. And I think VLC, uh, in regard to support to this kind of low latency, also has some limitation, but that's something that can be uh, overwhelmed. Um, from our experience, and we've been doing this for years now, for four years, I'm going to give you at the end of the presentation the link to uh, the technical information that allows you to reproduce this. Um, this is mainly a clock and synchronization issue. When you, once you're synchronized to the stream, you have some jitter due to the network and to some you know, production time that may vary, but on top of that, there, there are no real issues. Um, so if you hear me, the only source of latency would be basically the encoding time. You would, be, you would have the encoding time, you would package on the fly, uh, you would send it to the server, the server would be able to deliver directly, there would be a player requesting the content, seeing you know, what's the latest content available, you start receiving it. Um, the first thing about this is that uh, when we make standards, or the basic it's particularly true for the web people, uh, we consider that a certain number of uh, steps are just don't take time. That's just a, a shortcut uh, to build technology. But as you know, they are you know it takes time. Like it takes CPU time. Uh, you need to change the threads, and there are context switch. There are many reasons why you would get additional latency. And of course, when you consider the latency, if you make the addition and it makes like 100 milliseconds, it prevents you from getting like a real-time communication with the person. Um, since we have implemented this, um, the sources of latency that we have, the first one is from the source itself. Um, to transmit the information that we need to deliver, so if we're in the broadcast industry, they provide us with MPEG-TS, compliant MPEG-TS using DVD, which means that they introduce a kind of artificial delay between the audio and the video uh, at the production side, and uh, for us it creates some latency. There was something else um, that you're probably aware of. Um, to make the encoding, since we need to distribute the content, it's important that we get the best encoders. That's one of the reasons why um, we have a one now, and we're going to have a future generation codecs also. Uh, we're trying to be as efficient as we can on the encoding side. But it means that the encoder also needs some time to analyze the content uh, in the past, in the future, and you cannot uh, evaluate what's going to be in the future if you want to be at the lowest possible latency, which means that uh, the efficiency of the encoding is lower. Um, another thing also for really ultra low latency is that the packaging is frame based. So today if you want to package something that is subframe, um, you shouldn't use the MPEG packagers or you should use some tricks that are not widely available. Um, you may know that some for contribution, so if you want to get a signal and send it to a head and then for encoding for the broadcast stuff, they use codecs such as VC2, for example, where you have line latency. So you send line by line um, as you encode it. And the other source of latency I talked about uh, is being able to synchronize the different media. Uh, in the industry, there is a practice which is to send the different media on different channels. It creates a lot of troubles. And especially it means that you get a source that is synchronized, you're going to split the contents, and then you're going to have to find a way to resynchronize it, which means additional metadata to get 
the synchronization back, which also means that someone has to make the synchronization again, can be the MUX. The MUX, we can send MUX content, even if the industry doesn't like it, because there are many languages and it creates um, a matrix of production that's really insane, and then they get lower cash um, for in the CDN. Or it can be done with, this is what we have today, uh, on the playback. And um, the problem, and you know about it because I'm talking to the developers of PSC mainly, um, is that uh, there is too much complexity on the player. It's really easy to put all the complexity on the player saying, you know, it's going to be for the, the component that next to me, but in the end it's the player and the player needs to uh, deal with this. Um, as I said, the problem is that um, most of the time with these things we use, uh, so dash, the H is uh, about uh, HTTP, we use TCP. Uh, we have a lot of problems with TCP. Right. This would deserve a, a, a whole pretty day presentation. Um, but that's a problem. If something goes wrong, if the audio and the video takes different path, there are many reasons why uh, you could have additional latency. The second point, um, I talked about the encoding that's less efficient. Um, there is also something that's less efficient that's the packaging. So you make trade-offs so that you don't pack the different uh, uh, frames um, or you create additional fragments. It means that you have overheads that's one to seven percent. Um, and so as I said, it really works in a similar way to a TV. Basically, you connect somewhere, you start receiving frames. It may not be a random access point. So it means that if you want to start decoding, there may be a, a kind of start time or switch time if you uh, switch uh, the stream that's similar to what you have in TV. You receive the stream, you have to wait for the random access point to be decodable, and then you start decoding. <coughs> um, the other thing where we made, I think, good progress over the last few years is that we don't need fancy encoding. So that's also really important because previously we use uh, all the GDR stuff that we use uh, in real-time communication, but we don't. We actually don't need them. It just impacts the start of time, the start of time, not the latency. If you want to know more about low latency, there is a blog article that was written that basically summarized what I said, but giving you like pointers to uh, technical things that you need to implement, what's the correct way, what are uh, the different options that you have, what is the interoperability, and of course, um, a way to reproduce this work using open source software. Um, I'd like to thank the, my ex-colleague from uh, Telecom Paris, Cyril Pocolato, Jean Lefeuve also, so that's the core GPAC contributors, uh, Nicolas Veil from Macamay, who allowed us to make all this work, including the CDNs, uh, who have been really active to make this widely available, uh, and of course, GB and uh, uh, Videoland uh, Association for uh, inviting me. Thank you.